12th chapter of the book of Exodus. If you weren't here with us last week, I do encourage you to go and listen to last week's message. It's important to be able to listen to last week's message. Um, it kind of is, like it is part one. And this is, we're teaching on uh, Egypt, just ain't all that. Everybody say, Egypt, just ain't all that. Now, understand, I'm using slang, and, you know, and, and before anybody gets offended by the fact that I'm talking about the nation of Egypt, I'm talking in allegorical terms. In Bible terminology, Egypt, especially particularly in the Old Testament, represented captivity, bondage, the land of sin, the land of captivity. And, um, you know, Canaan represented the new birth. Now, just in case you're wondering, Canaan does not represent heaven. How do you know it doesn't represent heaven? There are giants there. There are no giants in heaven. There were, there were battles to be fought. There's no battles to fight in heaven. Hallelujah. So Canaan land, a lot of people say, oh, Canaan land's a type of heaven. No, Canaan land's a type of the new birth. Being born again believer, overcoming, winning victories. Hallelujah. By the power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. But Egypt represents the, 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 the land of bondage and the land of captivity. And so we, we have this here uh, that, you know, and the Bible tells us that when the children of Israel came out, you know, and all the things that happened, they got up to, you know, got up to the mountain. Moses went up for 40 days. I just watched the Ten Commandments this week, three hours and 39 minutes. Hallelujah. <coughs> In, on Blu-ray. Hallelujah. It's a long movie. I don't care how you look at it. You know, they even have, back then they had intermissions, you know. You know, you have that ten minute intermission, so you go out and go to the bathroom and, of course, go to the snack bar and get popcorn and drink. If you, you know, how many ever saw Ten Commandments at the theater? Now, I saw it. Now, I know it came out in 58, but they, I remember as a kid, they showed it at the drive-in. Yep. Little speaker hanging in your window. Big, monstrous 60-foot screen or whatever. You know, huge screen, horrible speaker. You know, kind of weird. But I, I saw it as a kid, as a kid at the, at drive, the Tice drive-in in Greenville. Hallelujah. I remember seeing, you know, the, the splitting of the Red Sea on the... You're talking about the big screen. These, these IMAX theaters have nothing on the old drive-ins. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now. Anybody, how many remember drive-ins? Oh, yeah. Glory to God. Then they got real fancy. If you, you know, the latter years before they went under, they started broadcasting on your FM. You could actually get it in stereo in your car. That was pretty cool. Hallelujah. All right. How did I get to that? Oh, well, anyway. Um, I remember watching Ten Commandments as a kid. I think it's a really cool movie. And, uh, but, you know, when the when children of Israel came out and, and Moses went up in the mount and, you know, and, and, and met with God, he gave them all the law. And I know, it's the, the, you know the movie, The Ten Commandments, focuses on the top ten. But, you know, what? in actuality, uh, he got all 3,000 uh, ordinance of the law at that same time. God gave them all of them. Okay? They were all, the whole law was given, not just the top ten. It's just those are the top ten. You know, David Letterman didn't come up with the top ten. God did. All right? He got it before Letterman, not, uh, yeah, Letterman ever showed up on television. God had it already done. Hallelujah. And I tell you, God's top ten will help, help save your life. Letterman's just make, me, make you laugh every once in a while, but they won't help you. All right? Glory to God. And so, when they, you know, while he's up in the mount, you know, it's 40, 40 days, and, and the children of Israel just, just got through dancing and singing about how God brought them out. Y'all hear you going home? I mean, they're up there. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Woo! And the tam tambourine's going. They're just dancing. Just a few days later, Moses is gone for 30 or 40 days. They hadn't heard anything from him. And all of a sudden, they're making golden calves to worship. Now we find out from the Scripture that it, they actually said... Uh, over in Exodus 15, it actually says that when they were making the calf, they, now remember, when they were singing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse turned right and are thrown into the sea, my father's God, amen, they're singing about how the fact God brought them out. God brought all the miracles. God did all the supernatural things, all the plagues, you know, hail falling from the sky and burning you know, I mean, you know, the, 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 the turning of the Red Sea, I mean, of, of the, um, of the, um, I say, nah, thank you, I, was, I wouldn't say tigress, but the Nile in, in the blood, and then the, 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 the plague of the frogs and the locust and, you know, and all the stuff, of the, and then the, the, the uh, death of the firstborn, all taking place. They see all these miracles. Pharaoh and the they finally say, get out of town, take all the gold, the jewelry, all the stuff out of here. 
And Moses just goes on a short vacation to spend with God. And what happens? Let me tell you. Here, here's the point. It's not. It doesn't take long for your flesh to speak louder than your spirit if you're not keeping it under control. That's good preaching. Go ahead. On. All right, I think I will. I said it doesn't take long for your flesh to start speaking real loud if you don't keep it under. You see, it's, it's real easy for the flesh, if it's not maintained in a spiritual atmosphere, if you don't keep it controlled, if you don't tell your flesh, no. Amen. Amen. For your flesh to rise up and start talking real loud. It got to talking so loud here, they made a golden calf, and then they said this, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Now, wait a second. We even call it Miriam's song. They're dancing with timbrels and, timber, uh, timbrels and tambourines and singing about how the Lord has triumphed gloriously. And now, all of a sudden, you know, they, their flesh gets, gets kind of out of whack. Get out from under the anointing. Start justifying stuff. And I'll buy also in this passage, we read this last week. I, need to get, I really probably ought to get back there and read this at least uh, down through here. Ooh, glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. There's so much here. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, where is it? I know it's in here. Oh, I got over to Nehemiah. Glory, glory, glory. Sorry, I should. I, I, you can't underline real good in this. Um, yeah, here we go. Nehemiah, I'm sorry, chapter 9. If you'll run over there. Nehemiah chapter 9, and then in verse, um, verse 13, says, Thou camest also upon the Mount Sinai, and spake to them, spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and commandments, and made known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandments that, that uh, commanded, commanded them precepts, statutes, and law by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them they should go in and possess the land of which thou hast sworn unto them. But... They and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. I am telling you, it doesn't take long to get out of the flow of God. All you got to do is harden your heart. Get stiff-necked about the things of God. Get to thinking you know every doggone thing. That your, your flesh is a better judge of, of what's going on than whatever. You know, you, you know that you know more than everybody else knows. Can I say something? No, you don't. And just go ahead and put your flesh under right now and tell it to shut up. Grab yourself by the ear and say, listen, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. You know, but like I said, I said Wednesday night, you know, there's one thing I have that when I stand here is I'm anointed to do what I'm doing. And it doesn't matter if I know everything or not. The anointing does. I said the anointing does. Now you'll get, now don't, be, don't pull a Miriam and an Aaron. We, we, some of you weren't here this last week. I want, I just, I'm trying to kind of cover some ground and catch you back up. You don't want to pull a Miriam and an Aaron. Now, number one, it's the spirit of pride. But, you know, they, they kind of got a little cocky about their place in, in the kingdom. And Moses was stuttered. Moses wasn't a, a, a great, you know, whatever. You know, if you, really, if you really look at it, Moses shouldn't be able to take care of the children of Israel. I mean, he, he stuttered. He didn't know what to do when they, you know, when they got out, had to get the judges. He didn't know what, how to handle all that. Somebody had to tell him what to do. I mean, get in out of the rain, boy. But I tell you what, you better not go to God and, and, and tell everybody that you know more than Moses knows. They went out and started telling everybody, hey, look, God speaks to us too. 
How many churches have been split by associates or people in church going, God speaks to me too? Now you better be glad we're not living in the days where they got what the Miriam got. Because she pulled that stunt and God, came, God got tired of it and finally came and said, look I, look, I do talk to you. But I talked to Moses face to face. And as a matter of fact, you're going to get struck with leprosy. And, you, and, and, and Moses had to go, and listen, the very one that she was talking against and speaking against had to be the one to intercede for and get her brought back in. But she had to spend seven days out of the camp for, camp for cleansing. Now, I'm not trying to, yeah, I am trying to scare you. We need to be wiser. And we don't need to just look at the things in the Old Testament and go, well, that was Old Testament, I'm under grace. Uh, we're going to cover that this, today. The Bible says they hardened their hearts. <laughs> I keep losing that place here because my, my stuff's all running together. I'm sorry. 17, where is that? About 17? Listen, 16. But they, but they and our fathers dealt proudly, hardened their heart, necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments. I'll tell you what, and this in verse 17, and they refused to obey. Neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion. Listen to this. Now remember, just a few days before, maybe a month and a half earlier, they're singing, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. They're so glad to be out of Egypt. They're so glad that they don't have to mess with Pharaoh anymore. They're so glad that all that stuff's behind them. They don't have to make brick anymore. And now... <laughs> Moses is gone for 35, 40 days. They didn't obey. They weren't mindful of his works. They hardened their necks. And in their rebellion, appointed a captain to return them to their bondage. That hadn't been two months since they couldn't wait to get out of Egypt. All they talked about was a redeemer coming. All they dreamed about was being set free. All they could think about was getting out of that mess. They wanted freedom. They wanted liberty. They wanted deliverance. They didn't want to be there anymore. They got delivered. But because they didn't stay and, stay and obey, they didn't stay and listen, they didn't keep their hearts right before God, they let their flesh take back over, they wanted to go back. There will always be a pull on your life to go back. Because Satan's not going to let go. He's not going to just walk away and forget you ever existed. It is his mission in his existence for anybody that came into the kingdom of God to pull them back into his kingdom. Or at least get them to be negl negligible or ineffective in God's kingdom. And how can he do that? If he can't pull you back into his, if he makes you carnal, gets you to live out of your flesh, then you become ineffective in the kingdom of God. Now, I know this isn't a shouting sermon, but it is a good place to say, help me, Jesus. Now, don't get up and walk out unless you're going to... Then I'm going to send the ushers out to find out what you're doing. Hallelujah. So they've come out, and we got, we got down in this part last week. This is about where we were. Um, yea, they made them a molten calf. Remember, remember they were singing, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. They made a molten calf in verse 18, and Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9 says, Yea, when they made them a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt. Now the God of heaven and earth has wrought miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Brought them through the Red Sea. Drowned Pharaoh's army in the midst of it. Glory to God. They walked over on dry ground. Drowned them in the midst of it. All the miracle signs and wonders. And just took a few days of being in the flesh. And now they're saying that this is the God that brought them out. And listen, and had wrought great provocations. Yet thou and thou manifold mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from them by day to lead them by the way. Neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light by the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest them thy good spirit to instruct them. Withheldest not thy manna from their mouth. And gavest them water for thirst. Yea, forty years didst they, thou sustain them in the wilderness. So they lacked nothing. Their, their clothes waxed not old. Their feet uh, swelled not. 
Now that's, all, that's something if you walk around all the time in the desert, your feet can swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms, nations, did divide them in corners. They possessed all the different lands. Verse 23, their children also multiplied as the stars of the heaven. Um, okay, then he goes on and talks about how they possessed in, in possess the land. Verse 28. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Talking to you about the fact that your flesh is something you need to battle. And you need to tell no. And you don't let it have the upper hand in any arena of life. Your flesh is an enemy. To your spirituality. You have to keep it under. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. I'm sorry not Hebrews. Romans. Chapter 12. Paul writes and says this. And says be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed. By the renewing of your mind. Now, we, now, we've heard this. We've, we've, heard, we've taught this along this line before, but, I, you know, you have to when you teach this because somebody may be hearing this for the first time. The word conform there in Romans 12, I believe, too. So it, it comes from a Greek word that means fashioned or molded, shaped. Okay? Um, somebody gave us for Christmas, uh, uh, gave us this, this, uh, this chocolate. It's hollow on the inside. It was like a cupcake, but it was chocolate. It was all just really good Pennsylvania milk chocolate. Mm, I'm just thinking about it. Makes my tongue makes me sell up. I'm just mm, glory to God. It has a hammer with it because it's hard enough. You hit it with the hammer on the inside. It's chocolate covered pretzels. It's the same chocolate and the little pretzels all on the inside of it. You know, but what, the way they made it is they pour that chocolate into a mold. Pour the top into a mold, the bottom into a mold, and then they put them. And once they fill it up, they put them on top of each other and use some type of hot chocolate. At the scene to melt them together. It's molded. It's shaped. It's fashioned. And the Bible says for us in Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Be not conformed. Don't be fashioned. It's shaped. Molded to this world. Now let me say something church. If the Bible tells you not to. You can be. I said, if the Bible tells you not to, you can be. The reason it's telling you not to is a warning that that, as that, that not only is not out there as, as, a, as a possibility, it is a distinct possibility that you can be shaped, fashioned, and molded to this world. He says, but, but be ye transformed, and we covered this word before in the past, that comes from the Greek word metamorpho which we get our English word metamorphosis from. And so he says, but be, you experience a metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. See, your spirit got born again. Your spirit wants to serve God. But you better watch out for your head. Because your head will come up with evil surmisings and reasonings that are contrary to the things of God if you're not constantly renewing it to the Word of God. It'll begin to reason out, this is okay and that's okay and I don't have to do this and that's all right to do and I don't need to do that. You know, and I don't even need a pastor. Oh, what is that pastor? No, he's just another man flapping his jaws, just wants my money anyway. That's evil reasonings and surmisings. How do you know? Because the Bible says, submit to those with the rule over you. And tell you got something telling you that's contrary to what the written word says. That is an evil reasoning and surmising that your mind, that, listen, what's happening? If you do not renew your mind to what the word says, you will be conformed to the world. Now, there is a wisdom of the world. But you know what the Bible says about it? It's earthly, sensual, and devilish. That's the wisdom of the world. There is, the world has wisdom. And it might really sound good. Nathan shared, he was talking the other day, he was talking about how his professor was sharing with him how that, you know, back in, back, you know, a lot of the music back from the 60s and stuff is out of tune. You know, guy, a lot, he, said, he said, if you hear some of these guys, like some of, the, some of the stuff that certain groups did, I won't call their names, but they were dropping acid and stuff, and they were tuning, and that all, he says, what happens is when you're high or drunk, your, your, your perception or your cognitive ability to hear music is altered. 
So you hear it, and it sounds great to you, but it's really out of tune. And so a lot of the music, and even and then not only if they weren't high or drunk, some, a lot of times they just had, they didn't have the right tuning instruments, either tuning forks or whatever, were, were cheap, and, they, and so they would tune to that or tune by ear. Now here's the thing. Once one guy got in tune, they all tuned to him. So they were in tune together, out of tune. And it sounded good. A lot of people thought, hey, that sounds great. But then when you put it against the proper tuning, they're out of tune. And I'm going to tell you, that's what happens with doctrines in the church. There's a lot of people who get together. They tune it up to the way they think it should sound. And everybody joins in with them, and it all sounds good. And when you put it against the word, they're out of tune. But it sounds good. There's a lot of things that sound good that are really out of tune. I think Nathan was talking about one, I, think, well, I forgot what song it was. Um, I think it was a Marvin Gaye song. And it could have been heard it through the grapevine. We were, we were watching something that, that, was, that was playing in the background. I said, you notice they don't put anything from the 70s, I mean from the, eight, the 90s or 2000s in these shows when they start retro and music. I mean, you know, dun, 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 dun. Don't, I, I just look for the California raisins to come across the screen any minute, you know. <laughs> Anybody remember the California raisins? Yeah. I heard it through the grapevine. And he said, you know, that's a great song. It's, it's out of tune. They tuned it out of tune, and everybody sounded good. Now, in music, it's okay. You can get away with it. You understand what I'm saying? You can get away with it in music when everybody's playing the same thing out of tune, and, it's, and everybody kind of likes the way it sounds. You can get away with it. But you can't get away with it with doctrine. You can't get away with it with the things of God. We have a standard that we have to go by. We have something that we have to be in tune with harmoniously, individually, and corporately called the Word of God. And we have to obey it. And we have to do what it says. And we can't let evil reasonings or surmisings enter in. And if we do, if we do not renew our minds to the Word of God, we will allow ourselves to become conformed to the world. Fashioned and shaped according to the world. We're to have a metamorphosis. What? We're not to be like the world. We're not to act like the world. We're not to be the world. Well, how are you going to win the loss? Anointing. Get anointed, you'll win the lost. They're not going to get anointed because you've got tats and, and piercings and bolts and, and chains and, you know, and you've got a lizard tail attached to your backside. And your whole body is a canvas. And listen, if you've got tattoos or whatever, I'm not, I'm not condemning you. I'm just telling you, don't, don't come to me and say, say that's how we're going to win the lost. <laughs> No tattoo ever won anybody to Jesus. No piercing except the, four, the ones that Jesus went through on the cross ever liberated anyone. Yeah, but they're like me. What we're trying to do is to get you not to be like you are. You need to be delivered from that, light, that, that mindset of the world. Like Nathan says, he's, you know, said, you know, he talks about how the dichotomy of, of young people are, you know, I'm being different, but yet all the young people being different are really being the same. You're not really being different. You're being exactly the same as all your buddies. You know, you're just being the same. You're, hey, you know what you're doing? You're just being in tune, out of tune. And just because you're all doing it don't make it right. Just because you're all in tune together doesn't make it sound right. Just because everybody thinks it's cool doesn't make it cool. Amen. Hello. Preaching, right? I, I got my amen son over here. That's right. Thinking it's right don't make it right. See, that's what the world does. The world says it, and that makes it right. Now, I, I can't help. i got to bring it. Yeah, it's getting a little. Anybody see any tobacco hanging from the rafters in here? I wonder what farmer brought it in today and hung it up there. Lord have mercy. I worked in tobacco barns as a kid. I know I, this is about how hot it gets. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Nobody ever worked. How many ever worked in tobacco? Old stick barns. All right. How to forget the bulk stuff, the stick barns. Amen. I was going to say something significantly powerful right before I got hot. Glory to God. Oh, I can't help this. But for about 30 years, 
The scientific community has been hollering global warming, man-made global warming, man-made global warming. The earth is going to get hotter. It's going to rise by this. We won't have a polar ice cap by 2013. By 2013, we were not going to have a polar ice cap. It's all going to be melted because of the heat. Seas are going to rise. We're going to wash away cities on the coast. And they said it. And people gave millions of dollars. We gave the United States of America, the people of the United States of America, not our government, gave $7.5 billion last year to foreign countries to fight global warming. Now, how many know what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere right now? Does anybody know what they call the, what they call the weather in the Southern Hemisphere right now? Summer. We're in winter. They're in summer. Okay. They've experienced the, the summer solstice. Okay? The sun has, has gone as far south as it's going to go, and so the southern hemisphere is in summer. Antarctica is the polar ice cap. It's not, not just an ice cap. It's actually a continent. You know? And there was an expedition of global warming scientists going to go down to Antarctica and get the information and data to prove global warming. Their ship got stuck in ice. The least amount of ice melt ever recorded in Antarctica. Yeah, three rescue ships got stuck. They finally had to helicopter them out to a Chinese ice cutter that had started him and they got stuck. They backed out. Just because they said the, warming, the world is warming up and getting hotter and we're going to melt the ice caps doesn't mean it's going to happen. But everybody bought into it. Everybody gave money to it. Everybody had to have green energy. We can't, we can't, you can't even buy a 60 or 40 watt incandescent bulb anymore. It cannot be manufactured in this country. And they're illegal to import. So if you don't like those stupid uh, uh, squirrely lights or little LEDs that are ugly, tough. But just because somebody says global warming is happening doesn't mean it's happening. They said it's going to take 5,000 trees to offset the carbon footprint of that expedition. You guys are going down there to prove something, and you're going to have to plant 5,000 trees to offset the diesel fuel you burn while you were trying to prove that the earth is getting warmer. Now, I say all that. See, that's the wisdom of this world. The world says something is so, and, and just because they say it's so, everybody starts acting like it's so, and it's not so. The only thing that we can go to that if we say it's so is so is when we go to the Word. That takes faith. The Word of God is the final authority. I said the Word of God is the final authority. If you think man, I mean, honestly, folks, man is powerful enough to change the whole earth and to, to change the, earth, the, the world temperatures and, and all this stuff. Oh, you, you got more faith than I got in Jesus. God created the earth. The earth cleanses itself. The earth is cyclic. Actually, last year, a lot of scientists started saying we're in for a 30-year cool-down period. Another, how many remember the 70s, the, uh, the covers of Newsweek and stuff? The coming ice age. That was 10 years before the global warming thing. The coming ice age. All on Newsweek, all the scientists were telling us there's a coming ice age. Now, why am I saying that? Because there's a wisdom that operates in this world that if the right person says it, it makes it so. That is a spirit. And if you don't watch it, that'll get into the church. And some preacher will come along and say that this is so. No scripture to back it up. No proof to back it up. They'll just say, God showed me. It doesn't matter what God showed you if you can't prove it out with the word. Right. Brother Hagin used to teach stuff. He said, now don't take my word for it. If you can't prove it out with the word, don't listen to it. Amen. You go prove it out with the word. You see what the Word says about it. Now, there's a teaching out in the body of Christ today, you know, that because we're under grace, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what, how we conduct ourselves. And because, you know, grace is going to make us do right, number one. And always their answer is this, that if you're really living in sin and doing wrong, you weren't even saved to begin with because grace wouldn't let you do it. So they have to answer, you know, what the, the, the truth of the matter, that people are living in sin and not doing right, and they, they answer by saying they couldn't even say it in the first place. See, that's, that's the same thing as the, the, uh, the eternal security bunch. That if they died, when the hell they weren't saved in the first place. Because it, well, it doesn't match their doctrine. What does the Bible say about stuff? Now, we just read to you how they came out of Egypt. I know I'm running late. Dear Lord Jesus, just my recover took as much time as last week's sermon. 
Happens that way sometime. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Just turn the air conditioner on here, please. Dear Lord. Is anybody warm besides me? That wasn't a joke. And Sunshine, I know you're a little cool, but if you want to come sit right here on the platform by me, you can be on television and get warm at the same time. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading verses 1 through 15, and I may stop and make commentary along the way. Moreover, brethren, I would that you should not be ignorant. All right? Now, underline that. What does Paul not want us to be? Doesn't want us to be ignorant. That means what? You can be ignorant. Isn't that right? He doesn't want you to be ignorant, but you can be ignorant. How that our fathers were under the, the cloud and all passed through the sea. We're under, all baptized under Moses in the cloud and the sea. Did eat the same spiritual meat. Did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank that spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Now let me say this. There is Old Testament allegories or types and shadows of the new birth life. Even though they weren't born again. And this is one of them. In other words, it's saying that they were baptized into Moses. Just like we're baptized into Christ. You know, um, <clears throat> they drank the same spiritual meat, they ate the same spiritual meat, drank the same spiritual water, came from the rock, the rock was Christ. So in other words, this is telling us, this is an allegory or a type of, uh, the, in the Old Testament, of what the new birth is like for the New Testament believer. Okay. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were, were for, uh, these things are, were our examples. Underline that. These things are our examples. Underline it. If it's an, now, the Paul, the teacher and preacher of grace, as he is called by many people today, when they pull out certain scriptures, Paul said the Old Testament actions of Israel were an example for us. How can that be? They weren't under grace. Not like we are. Y'all hear you're going home. Now these things are our examples to the intent, what well, here to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Anybody got amplified? Read that out loud, amplified. First Corinthians ten verse six. Oh, you're getting it on your computer. All right. Loud. After evil and carnal things. After evil and carnal things. So not everything that, you know, that is a lust of the flesh in this world is evil. It can be carnal. We got a lot of people trying to find ways to be carnal and still be spiritual. You can't do it. Why? Because carnality will cause you to conform to this world. Carnality will draw you back. Remember what did, what did, what did uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews say? It says, let us lay aside the weight. I mean, that's, that's, that's Romans 12, 1, isn't it? Find it for me. Let me find it. Until you start using this stupid thing, and, and I love it, but it's, it becomes stupid sometimes because you get so dependent upon it, you forget you can use a Bible. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, who? All those guys in Hebrews 11. Amen? Let us lay aside every weight... And the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let me say something. Weights are not sin. Weights are things that will pull you into captivity. Weights are things that will pull you back. Weights are things that slow you down in your spiritual progress. And they may not be sin, but they're a weight. And let me say something, church. 
These people who are trying to tell you to live in the midst and with the accompaniment of your weights are slowing down your growth. They're not have, they don't have your best spiritual interest at heart. They got a message they want to preach and get money from it and be a big dog of, among the people so they can go talk about how great a preacher they are. They don't have your best interest in heart. You, they don't have the heart of Paul. I wish I could be cursed for Israel's sake that they might be saved. That's the heart of Paul. Not keep doing what you're doing, see how much you can get away with, and we'll all slip into heaven together. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, what awaits? Well, what do we just read over here in 1 Corinthians? These are written as our examples that we should not lust after evil things or carnal things. What happens when carnality enters in? You move away from spirituality. What did Paul write in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans? If you sow to the flesh... You shall of the flesh reap corruption. What's that? Carnality. I said carnality. There's a lot of things going on in the church today. You know, Colorado just passed, you know, last year sometime, passed uh, the legalization of marijuana. Does that mean it's all right now for all the people in the church to go, to go stand outside and smoke a bomb before church? It's legal in the state. There's no law against it. The Bible doesn't say a thing about smoking weed. Hello? But it's carnality. You're catering to your flesh. You're catering to the dictates, dictates and appetites of your flesh in a, in, in a way that is, that is not productive, that is, that is counterproductive. Now somebody come along and say, what about them folks who eat too much? Same thing, you don't need to be a pig. Amen. Amen. You don't need to be gorging yourself. You don't need six two-liter sodas a day. Amen. I get it. But they don't put you in an altered state of consciousness. Hello? Now, if you have to have your Coke every minute, you've got to have a Coke. You can't live without a Coke. You're addicted to Coke. You need to stop drinking Coke. I'm not talking about cocaine. I'm talking about Coca-Cola. Amen? I get that stuff. But you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's just so much stuff going on in the church. We can fornicate. We can drink. We can smoke. We can, we can, we can do whatever we want to do because it really don't matter. It's just our bodies. No? That's carnality. You're feeding the appetites of your flesh. You are creating a weight in your life that grace will not take care of. How do you know? Because he told you to put it away. He didn't say grace would take care of it for you. He said, let us lay aside. Come on now. Somebody come talk to me out here now. Let us lay aside. Well, it really doesn't. I'm just going to tell you, preacher, I don't believe a word you're saying. It just don't matter what we do. Oh, really? 1 Corinthians, we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hallelujah. Now, these things are written for our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things or carnal things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, listen to this, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, can I ask y'all something? How many know, according to uh, the world, you can't watch a sports event without drinking a beer? A beer? Honestly. You, and, and listen, I've been to the grocery store when the sports events are going on. I don't see one guy going in and buying one beer and walking out with it. He's got a case. If he gets a chance, he's got a, he's got a keg. Come on now. And not only, can you not, not only do you have to have a beer, if you have the beer, you're going to have a lot of hot, sexy women running around the apartment. And your team's going to win. That's right. And if they lose, that's all right. You've already got the, uh, the, 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 the uh, medication to deal with your depression. They sat down to eat and drink, and then they rose up to play. We have to become more mindful of separating ourselves unto the things of God than trying to be like the world. See, I can do all the stuff the world does and still serve God. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to flat out tell you. No, you can't. 
you might be born of God, but you're not serving God. You're serving your flesh. And he said, here, he's telling you, right here he says, and uh, here he says, the people, he said, don't be idolaters of some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Next verse. I love this, because people say it don't matter if you fornicate or not, it's okay, God's grace covers it. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and 20,000. This is an example. Now, fornication is any kind of sexual sin. It's not just, you know, it's any sexual sin. It covers everything. If you're doing anything outside the marriage of a man and a woman, not a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, that's not marriage. I don't care what the state says. It's not marriage. You can call it what you want to call it. It ain't marriage. I don't care what you call it. Jesus never said anything about it. Oh, really? Didn't you read it? He said in the beginning it was not so. That a man, God, God ordained, I'm kind of paraphrasing, that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and the two should be one flesh. Amen. I think Jesus dealt with it. Amen. I feel like a woman. I don't care what you feel like. I remember that Chevy commercial, the guy was singing the song in the back seat, and the guys all kind of moved away from him. I feel like a woman. He's, he's kind of singing with it. And the two, the two other guys in the backseat of the truck, they, they slide to the doors. Leave him in the middle. Doesn't matter. Jesus did deal with it. Fornication is any sexual sin. Anything outside the confines of marriage. Anything outside the confines of God-ordained marriage. It's fornication. And he said... <coughs> and the reason I bring this up, there was a guy I know, he had, a pastor of a church, had a couple come in for couple counseling. Not marriage counseling, couple counseling. And uh, the guy talked to him, and he said, well, well, I think I know what the problem is. They said, well, he said, you're living together, committing fornication, and you're not married. Oh, no, pastor, we're under grace. That doesn't matter. <laughs> you're what? We're under grace. It doesn't matter. No, 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 no. See, here it is. We're having troubles. And they won't accept the real reason they're having troubles because someone's taught them to be out of tune together Amen. with a false teaching. That it's okay to commit fornication because you're under grace and grace has already taken care of that. That doesn't matter. Because nothing I do can take me out of the covering of grace. Grace then why did he even bother to tell us don't commit fornication like they did and 23,000 of them died? Why would he even put that in here? This is Paul now, folks. Why would he even put that in there if it wasn't important? What? Yielding to the carnality of your flesh will bring destruction to your life. This, the, the, uh, uh, the Old Testament says this. I can't remember if it's Proverbs, Psalm, or Proverbs, Proverbs or Psalms. I was going to call it <laughs> Prof. Psalms, you know. Or some verbs. It's in one of them. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. We're tuning to human reasoning. We're getting it tuned to human reasoning. And everybody's tuning in with us. But the end thereof is death. These are written as our examples. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them did. And in one day fell 23,000. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end there is death. I think literally means destruction. The end is destruction. You bring destruction into your life when you begin to let the carnality of your flesh and the carnality of your mind and thinking dictate to you what is right and what is wrong and what is spiritual and what is not spiritual. And you can even go so far as to the people of the children of Israel, just like they did. Moses was gone just, too, just a few days too long, and they built a molten calf and said, that's the God that brought us out of Egypt. Not God, that's the God that brought us out of Egypt. How can you just put them together? You just got to finish putting them together. How in the world could you, he be the one that brought you out? Human reasoning. See, human reasoning can get so stupid and be so thinking it's so right. I, I sit down sometimes and look at the stuff that's going on in the world and I think, only in the mind of those kind of people could that really work. Hello. 
I mean, how in the world can you think that works? Well, let's go on. We're not done. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. Not examples, but in samples means types. And were written, this and were written, everybody say this, and were written. Why? For our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now, these are, ad, these, are, these are admonishments, these are admonitions, these are warnings from the Apostle Paul to the church to look at what happened to Israel when they let their mind take over, when they didn't keep their mind renewed to the Word of God, when they didn't stay in the anointing, when they let their carnality overtake them and think that it was okay to do what they were doing and what happened to them. They were written and there's an admonition, don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to you. Well, how do I don't let it happen to me? Hebrews 12. I mean, Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? Keep. Now, go back. Remember, if you go back over to Exodus, they did not obey, but hardened their hearts. Not, I'm sorry, Nehemiah. They did not obey. Remember, we talked a couple weeks ago. Some of you may not have been here. It was like the week before Christmas. How that Abraham received the promise. And God said this when he took Isaac up to offer him on the altar, on the mount. The, God spoke to him and says, because you obeyed my promise voice I will do this I'll multiply your seed as the sand of the seashores and the stars of the heaven because you obeyed that was Abraham the father of our faith there's a whole part of a chapter in the book of Romans about Abraham's faith that we're supposed to follow see people people come along and go uh, that's Old Testament I don't have to look at honey I'm telling you here's a whole half a chapter talking about what we better look at in the Old Testament Stop, throw, stop listening to that kind of teaching. Well, that's the Old Testament. It doesn't apply to me. Well, Paul just applied it to you. Hello? I said, the Apostle Paul just applied it to you by the Holy Ghost. He said, these were written for our admonition. What? We're to look at it. We're to learn from it. You can learn by watching what others did and learn by yourself. <clears throat> when you see people make stupid mistakes. Now, I, I think um, we came home a few years ago, our, our neighbor's kids, he's a, as great as your age or a year younger or two, about your age, you're older, close to his age. Okay, then Grady. Our Grady's our, our neighbor behind us. Came home one day and there were flames shooting up 15 foot up in the air. What happened? Great, he just decided to take some poor gas all over and throw a match on and see what happened. And he's, he's about to panic because he, like, you know, he thinks he'll catch the fence on fire, our playhouse on fire, and the trees on fire. <clears throat> he's out there trying to put it out, trying to figure out how to put it out. I think he finally gets it calmed down. And I go and say, Great, son, don't ever do that again. I said, now, I love you. I said, I would hate to see you scarred for life. You're going to have to talk to my son. Don't, don't, don't ever do that. Well, the other thing was which y'all did was throw matches. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> I was trying to dress it up for the church. <clears throat> Don't you ever be that stupid? You see what he could have been? He could have been blown up, could have caught on fire. Now listen, I know a little bit about gas and stupidity. I was working for uh, I was working for a mobile home company one time in between, you know. Uh, Getting saved and going out to Rainbow, and I was, you know, and, and the boss had a had had the property. And, you know, he had his own double wide on the lot, and he lived there and ran his business off of there. But behind had a fence. They just threw a bunch of trash back there, old wood and stuff. And he wanted me to burn it, so I went there and just doused it five gallons of gasoline. Just I just drenched it. <laughs> you know, can I say something? If you're going to burn something, get diesel fuel. Diesel fuel is not anywhere near as volatile or, or, or vapor explosive as gasoline is. Diesel, you can actually stand there and light it, and it'll, just, it'll start catching and light up. Pretty close. I, mean, you know, I, would, I wouldn't stand right there and light it. Well, anyway, five gallons of gasoline. Now, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to go on the other side of the fence. and going to take something and throw it over. 
<laughs> and it was a wood picket fence, had little holes like this. And I took something and went, and it went, whoosh! Flames shot through the holes. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm diving to the ground, you know, thinking, okay, don't ever. Son, don't ever use gasoline to light a coals. Don't ever, you know, don't ever do that. We can learn by the stupidity of others. Or we can learn ourselves. Sometimes when we learn ourselves, it's not so good. We are being told here, learn by the stupidity of Israel. Learn by the carnality of Israel. There are consequences for following after the flesh and being carnal. They don't show up right away. Hello? They may not show up next week. They may not show up the very second you do it, but it will show up. I don't think that day one, that they, the first day that Moses went up in the mount, they made a calf and said, this is the God that brought us out. There were 30, 40 days, there were 35 days, where somewhere into there, you know, there must have been rumors and talking going on in the camp. Moses isn't here, you know. Oh, we can go back to Egypt. There's food there. We got a leader there. They'll take us back. They'll give us our homes back. You keep listening to that junk. Keep listening to it. It was better when I was, when I was in the world. Christians will say, the world loved me more than Christians do. And I'm going to tell you, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie of the devil. <clears throat> I was better off serving the devil. Yeah, and you were going to hell. Woo! Going party hardy right on into the region of the damned. Come on now. He said that in church. That's what it is. I know the Marines say they don't go to hell. When they go to hell, they just regroup. But that really doesn't happen there. You don't get to regroup. You don't get to have a party and have a stairway back into heaven. It is the Hotel California. You check in and you don't ever check out. You did not have it better in the world. That's why you got saved. Amen. You've forgotten the God that brought you out of Egypt. You've forgotten how it was when you were living in bondage to the enemy. You've forgotten what it was like to live as a slave to the bondage and captivity of your flesh. You've forgotten that. Why? Because you shut down your spirit and let the mind and the flesh take over again. And Paul writes that this is an admonition to us. He says, if you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. <coughs> I've watched people. Listen, I've pastored long enough. I've seen what people do. Pastor Ed doesn't know what he's talking about. Pastor Ed this, Pastor Ed that, Pastor Ed. The next thing you know, they're out in the world. Their kids are living like, like dogs. They don't go to the Lord to get relaxed. They go get a glass of wine. Now, before, they wouldn't have touched it. Now, I just need a glass of wine to get relaxed. Why don't you go pray in the Holy Ghost? I'll tell you what, praying in the Holy Ghost, 10 minutes will do more for you than wine will ever do for you. Well, is it a sin? No, but it's carnal. You're letting it do the job of the Spirit. You're letting, you're letting it take the place of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You're giving heed to something that, that, that will take control of your life. And, and somebody put a, 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 I don't have it, but uh, Kirk Dubois from Rama posted it the other day on, the, on, on his Facebook page. Of all the things in the world of, of deaths and accidents and suicides and murders that have, are alcohol related. And they by, by and far of any other cause of any of them, alcohol is the cause. This is depressant. Number one, that's why people say, I feel better after drinking. You depressed yourself. You, 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 go pray in the Holy Ghost and get relaxed. Jesus said, peace I give unto you, not as the world gives my peace I give unto you. Get, get some Holy Ghost wine. Amen? Get the relaxation of the Spirit, praise God. Come into a place, when you, get, when you come out of the presence of God, you're all relaxed and you don't, you don't need anything else. Amen. Well, I need to get jacked up this morning so I can get going. Well, dance in the Holy Ghost and go out full of the Spirit. 
They're not saying sin. I, you know, we, we, we're not even going to deal with this sin or not. How about this carnal? The Bible doesn't say anything about smoking cigarettes, but you know, they're not good for you. It's carnal. The nicotine calms you. Hello? It's, it's just another, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a substitute for the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And the Bible says not to lust after evil or carnal things like they did. Why? Because the more you give ye, he, he, <laughs> give ye to, give heed to and yield to the flesh, the more it's going to speak louder than what the Spirit's saying. And eventually you can come to the place you'll say, it's better off where I, I'm going to get me a captain to take me back where I came out of because it was better over there. No, it's not. There's nothing you left in Egypt that's even worth going back for. That's why I titled this sermon, Egypt just ain't all that. So you get on this side of it, you get back in where this devil starts talking to you, and you start yielding to the flesh, and all of a sudden it starts looking better again. They thought it looked better back in Egypt than it was with serving God out in the wilderness. How could they believe that? They hardened their hearts, they obeyed not, and they began to lust after evil and carnal things didn't want to be spiritual anymore now i'm not going to look out there but you just think to yourself how many need your toes healed right now come back tonight for the healings rally we'll pray for them and just let them hurt this afternoon and keep you in remembrance of what you did what you had to deal with today amen, amen. great there's people teaching a grace message it's not a Bible grace message. They don't use, they use a, a partial scripture and manipulate it. And then everything else is God told me. Really? But the Bible says this. But God told me. God told Jim Jones some stuff too. And 800 people drank his Kool-Aid. And died. Because... He got too far out beyond this book. He was an oracle for God. Mm -mm. If you're out beyond this, you're, you're too far gone. And you need to turn around and come back. And if this is no longer the foundation and the, and the, and the, and the voice to your life, and that you've got reasonings that excuse. I had somebody used to tell me all the time. You know, start, start talking about walking up. Well, the devil told, God showed me I don't have to be the devil's doormat. Would you please find me scripture and verse for that? Here, just find it. I don't have to be the devil's doormat. God showed me this and God showed me that. I got so tired of hearing them say God showed me and they didn't have scripture for it. It was their own little deal with God. You don't have little deals with God. I know people don't want to hear this word. You've got to submit to what God said. And if what God said is what God said, then you've got to do what God said, and you have to obey. It's a four-letter word. O-B-E-Y. Why? Because your flesh wants to go back to Egypt. Your flesh is looking for ways to get back to Egypt. And, you're, and, you, and when you, you think of it from a Christian standpoint, why? Because your flesh is stupid. It's carnal. It, you, why would a woman stay with a man and get beat? Because the fear of the unknown is a greater fear they have than being beat every day for saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. They love their flesh. It would rather live in what it knows. Why? Because walking by faith is not a flesh event. It's spiritual. And we've been trained all our lives to be flesh beings. Everything about society now in the United States of America is so political correctness. It's all about people's flesh. Everything has to do with their flesh. All the political correctness has to do with everybody's flesh. 
Can anybody say anything without offending somebody? They're gonna change the, they want to change the name of the Washington Redskins because it might offend the Native Americans. Well, I'm not offended. You're not Native American. Oh, yeah, I am. I was born here. If I was born here, I'm a Native American. Hello? The, the people we call the Native Americans or the, or the Indian tribes, they didn't start out here. Let me tell you something. You know where they started? They all started the same place you started. Eden. I ain't talking about Eden, North Carolina, either. I'm talking about the garden. We all came out of Adam and Eve. And things happened and things, you know, over, over, over thousands of years, everybody, tra you know, migrated. You know, but you can't call them the Washington Redskins anymore because somebody's going to get offended. Well, what, what are you going to name the teams? You can't call them. The, I mean, the Cowboys are all going to get offended with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, you stereotype the guys who ride horses and, 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 and get cattle. We can't name them the Seattle Seahawks because the Hawks, the Seahawks will be embarrassed to be on, the, the, on, on those teams. You know, we, they're, 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 they're a beautiful animal. We can't do that. We can't call them the Bobcats, the Charlotte Bobcats, because, you know, well, you know the Bobcat has rights. What's happening? It is carnality gone, uh, gone crazy, and people, everything they do is about, the, about carnality. Children in kindergarten in California can now choose the bathroom they want to go to because of their, they've identified themselves as the opposite sex. K through 12 just started January 1, state of California. That is pure, carnal, humanistic reasonings. Let me say something. The church should want nothing to do with that. We should run from that with everything we got. We should want to be spiritual. We want to be light. We want to be salt in the earth. And if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith is its saltiness? If you put a bushel over the light, where will the light be? We are to be light. We, how are you going to get there? You're only going to get there by being spiritual, by walking after the things of the Spirit. Can you say amen? You cannot get there by going back to Egypt and ha or having a desire to go back to Egypt. Let me give you an example. Somebody, not Egypt, but Sodom. Remember the Bible says that when Lot moved into Sodom, the Bible says his righteous soul was vexed daily. Go study it. His righteous soul was vexed daily. And then when the angels came to get him out, he so messed up and so carnal <coughs> that when they come to, <coughs> when, they, when the people in town, because it was homosexuals, and they saw these, they thought, these angels, they thought that, hey, woo, got the new boys in town. They came to his house, and he said, here, take my daughters. Now, they come to my house, it's going to be the, 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 the sawed-off shotgun in their face. You ain't getting my daughter, you're not getting the angel, you ain't getting... As a matter of fact, really, guys, I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm just going to get out of the way because they can take care of themselves. But he, he was so vexed in the perverseness of his thinking, the way to protect the angels was to give him his daughters to do whatever they wanted to to him. I say that's a, the vexed, righteous soul. But remember, they were told not to look back. And Lot's wife was so consumed with the lifestyle she had in her Egypt that she looked back and was turned to a pillar of stone. And the, New T and the Bible tells us this, what? Remember Lot's wife. There's a, there's a warning there. What you came out of is nothing that you want to go back into. It holds nothing for you. Oh, but I can do this and still be a Christian. That's not the point. Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean things, saith the Lord. We don't preach that much in our churches anymore because people don't like to hear it. Come out from among them. How are we going to witness to them? You go in with a mission to witness. You don't go in a mission to live with them and be like them. Your mission is to win them, not be like them. 
Are you here? Whenever the, in, the old, in the New Testament, whenever they needed answers, whenever they needed strength, whenever they needed help, the Bible didn't say they ran to the group of sinners. It says they came into their own company. Where iron sharpens iron. And they began to admonish one another. And then they would begin to pray. And then God would shake the room they were sitting in. Glory to God. And they'd say, Lord, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we might speak thy word. And send them back out. Caught, locked, and ready to rock for Jesus. They didn't come up with a plan and say, now, Lord, how can we be more like them and sneak them in? We don't need, listen, we don't need converts. We need, we need new births. We need miraculous encounters between the heart of the lost and the one who baptizes them into the body of Christ. Where they're transformed and made new by the power of God. The same power that raised Christ up from the dead dwell in you. Come on now. We don't want to talk about that in the church anymore. We want to tell everybody it's okay to do what you're doing because they'll, they'll keep coming and we'll have the numbers and we'll get the money to do all the, the programs we want to do. What good are our programs if we're not getting people born again and transformed and discipled? People don't want to hear messages like I preach. I know that. They want to go somewhere where they don't preach it. It's nice over there. They don't, they, they, I can do whatever I want to and still, and still be a Christian. And go to, go to heaven earlier than the rest of us. One guy said one time, he said, Hey, can I smoke and still go to heaven? The preacher said, Yeah, just a lot earlier than the rest of us. Hello? Come on now. I told a guy one time, he was, he was living in homosexuality. Actually, he, got it, he was worse than that, got into bestiality. Called one of us to cast the devil out of him and pray for him. We went and prayed, and then I had a word from the Lord. I said, if you ever go back into this lifestyle again, you'll die. I just didn't make that. I just didn't say that because I felt like I was saying it. The Spirit of God came on me. I said, I, looked at, I turned to the pastor and said, hey, this is what the Lord just told me. Can I say it? He, he, he said, yeah, go ahead. I said, the Lord told me that if you ever go back into this lifestyle, you will die. What about grace? That was, that was his grace. God's grace told him ahead of time, don't do it or else. Don't tell me that wasn't grace. Here's the warning from God. I'm telling you, you got a chance. If you just reject this and renounce this and stay clean and free, you won't, you, you'll, you'll live. But if you go back into it, you will die. A few years later, he called one of the guys that was with us that day. He said, well, I want you to know that I've, I've gotten right with the Lord again. But I'm dying. I have AIDS. I don't have long to live. I mean, I'm glad he's going to heaven. But he didn't have to go that way. God's grace didn't allow him to do that and get away with it. God's grace warned him ahead of time. And gave him a chance not to live that way. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your anointing and your word. No, this is a somber, solemn message, not your normal beginning of the year type sermons. But Lord, I know you've told me to preach this. I know you told me to share this. I know you, you anointed me to say these things because you want your people to walk holy after you and want to walk, them to walk in the fullness of all you have for them. And that living one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom is not going get, to get the job done for what you have for them to do and what you have in store for them. So, Father, I thank you. The Spirit of God's dealt with us strongly today with these things that I've said. And it'll eradicate evil thinking in their minds and earthly thinking in their minds. And they'll think in harmony with the Spirit of God and separate ourselves. We will separate ourselves unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up, please. Stretch your hands. I'm going to pray with these prayer cloths. Hallelujah. I don't know how many are here, but you know, I know you needed two, so come get two at the end of the service. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we pray over these in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We thank you that the healing anointing, oh, 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 is made manifest now and released into these claws, these handkerchiefs. Thank you that when they lay it on the sick, that the diseases will go out of them, the evil spirits will go out of them, they'll be made every whit whole from the top of their head to the soles of their feet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We decree it as so, and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Thank you that cancer, thank you that mental disorders, thank you that uh, AIDS and lupus and any other diseases are, are driven out of people in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, whoever provided those, thank you. I think, was that, was that, well, thank y'all. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. There's still some of that I didn't have on me, so if you want to pick those back up for you, that's okay. Whatever you want to do. Hallelujah. So we're not going to do. These things are written as our examples that we should not lust after evil or carnal things like they did. Not just evil, carnal. Carnal. Your flesh. Appetites. There may not even be sin. There's appetites that are weights in your life that are going to draw you back to thinking and acting like you did before you got saved. And can I say it again? Let's say it together. Egypt just ain't all that. 